It was actually at an HBS Latin American private equity conference right here in Burden Auditorium in the spring of 1998 that I stalked my first unsuspecting target, Peter Brook, one of the founding fathers of international venture capital. Next was Eduardo Elstein, a successful Argentine real estate entrepreneur who is most famous for turning George Soros into the largest landowner in Argentina. Eduardo acquiesced to a 10-minute meeting with me, so I had to get to the point quickly. Sure enough, a few minutes into the meeting, Eduardo began looking at his watch and offered to get me a meeting with George Soros. I thanked Eduardo for his kind offer and told him I was interested in him as an entrepreneur. I said, you're an entrepreneur, I'm an entrepreneur, Endeavor is created to support entrepreneurs. Eduardo, I want your time, your passion, and $200,000. <laughs> to which Eduardo turned to his colleague and said, esta chica esta loca. <laughs> she seemed so charming initially, but now it's like I'm in a bad B movie where I'm standing in the shower and she's coming at me with the knife. <laughs> Eduardo hadn't realized I speak Spanish, so I broke in, estoy decepcionada, I am disappointed. This from the man who walked into George Soros' office and walked out with a $10 million check. You're lucky I only asked you for $200,000. At that, Eduardo wrote the check and committed to becoming chairman of Endeavor Argentina. <laughs> to this day, Eduardo says it's the best investment he's ever made. Why? Because when I talked to Eduardo, I told him that Endeavor would be a new kind of nonprofit. <clears throat> we presented a value proposition where we would not just produce results, we would actually measure their impact. And like most social entrepreneurs, we would use the energy and tools of the private sector to address a social problem. In our case, that problem was the gap between the private equity that was going just to the top 10 families in every emerging market and the microfinance solutions that focused on those at the bottom of the pyramid. Endeavor targets the high impact entrepreneurs who slip between the cracks. While we don't operate a fund, we're the neutral Switzerland that builds bridges of trust between capital providers and the entrepreneurs who receive Endeavor's seal of approval. We do everything in our power to nurture, inspire, and support these emerging market innovators. Bill Draper, the early venture capitalist and former head of the United Nations Development Program, once described Endeavor as venture, cap venture capital without the capital. For years, this was the pithiest way to describe Endeavor. These days, though, that pretty much describes all venture capitalists. Ultimately, Endeavor's mission is to coin a phrase that doesn't exist but should, to meritocratize wealth. We believe that by removing barriers and increasing support for future business role models, we will move the macroeconomic needle of these emerging economies. Today, Endeavor operates in 11 countries on five continents, and we have ambitious plans to expand to 25 countries by 2015. But like all social entrepreneurs and social enterprises, Endeavor's growth took time and perseverance. In early 2000, I sat on a panel at the World Economic Forum with Mohammed Yunus, Bill Drayton, and Pamela Hartigan, who now runs the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship at Oxford, to introduce our movement to the Davos community. I can't say we were embraced. More than one Davos man and even the extremely hard-to-find Davos woman snubbed us as gate crashers and wondered who'd let us into the party. No, even by the year 2000, the A-list crowd wasn't all that interested in our business solutions to development. So what or who changed attitudes? Certainly, the long-term success of organizations like Ashoka and the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship were key. <clears throat> But let me posit that the tipping point of our movement came with three developments. Let's call this the great man theory of social entrepreneurship. First, early in 2006, Bono, 
morphed from rock star to social entrepreneur as he launched Product Red, a global branding campaign to fight AIDS in Africa. In an instant, social entrepreneurship became cool. Second, in late 2006, Muhammad Yunus won the Nobel Peace Prize for his pioneering work with Grameen Bank and the field of microcredit. Finally, our movement had a recognizable leader. Third, in January 2008, Bill Gates used the Davos Forum to launch his vision for creative capitalism, quote, where business and nonprofits work together to create a market system that eases the world's inequities. Gates then announced his, deci his decision to step down from Microsoft to de devote himself full time to global health, development, and education. An iconic business entrepreneur joined ranks with social entrepreneurs across the globe. Our movement had moved mainstream. I'll say it once more, we've come a long way, baby. But as important as visionary leaders have been to this movement, I want to switch gears to consider an overlooked point. Back in college, we all debated whether change resulted from great men or great times. It would be nice if great women factored into the debate, but at least when I was an undergrad, dead white men ruled. In the case of social entrepreneurship, both the leaders and the times mattered. Social entrepreneurs, I believe, benefited from a number of trends of the past two decades. The first was the fall of the Berlin Wall and the rise of democratic capitalism. Think of Francis Fukuyama predicting the end of history. Basically, the world shrank and interconnectedness grew. As Tom Friedman, whom Esther mentioned uh, recently, called Endeavor the best anti-poverty program of all, dubbed it, the world became flat. Suddenly, ideas could spread not just within a community or a nation, but around the world. A social change model developed in Toledo could be exported to Tunis or Taipei. Another trend involved the changing roles of government and the private sector. It became clear governments could not solve all of society's problems. There were visible gaps in the delivery of quality health care and education, in the promotion of environmental standards, and in services to uplift the poor. Yet the private sector was not always prepared to step in either. Many services and sectors lay beyond companies' visible self-interest. Harnessing markets to serve the world's poor or even to help grow a middle class simply did not factor into the bottom line. Social entrepreneurs rose up and attempted to bridge these gaps. We devised, implemented, and marketed innovative solutions to problems others wouldn't touch. We learned to connect, share best practices, and replicate successful models across borders. Perhaps most importantly, we calibrated and navigated a new balance between government and the private sector. We derided slow and ineffectual bureaucracies, and we lauded the entrepreneurial spirit. We held ourselves up as capitalism with a human face. And it worked. But I have news for the social entrepreneurship mafia. The world has changed. <laughs>